Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the podcast, I'm speaking with Dave Everett. You know Dave as This Old Sword Blade Reviews on YouTube. Dave has been a practitioner of the martial arts for most of his life, training with luminaries of the field like Grand Tuhan Leo Gahe Jr. And uh, just from personal experience, he is a bad man. Dave also owned and ran his own martial arts schools from the 70s into the 90s. Over the years, Dave became a prolific knife collector. It's no wonder being a Kali expert, a uh, collector of knives, swords, and other edged weapons. He has a sprawling eclectic collection that he kindly shares with the rest of the world on his YouTube channel. And I'm really excited to have him here, take the time to chew the fat with him um, and talk all about knives, swords, and other edged implements. Uh, but before we go there, are you irrationally fond of knives? And do you like this show? Well, then maybe you should go over and check us out on Patreon. There are three levels of support. You get Knife Junkie stickers, a mention on the podcast. You get other exclusive content, uh, early access to the podcast with no ads during the show, and more. Your support helps fund the infrastructure needs of the show, like hosting, servers, apps, and equipment. And also, it goes to fund the purchase of knives for review and giveaway. So check us out on Patreon and see what helping us gets you. The quickest way to go there is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. Dave, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. How you doing? Thanks for having me, Bob. It's been oh, a while. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. I mean, it's, it is it is a pleasure to have you here. Uh, you and I uh, met a while back when I first started the show, and you've come on Thursday Night Knives quite a bit, and I've gotten some teases and and, and a little taste of your collection and your background uh, but uh, I'm interested to get into it today because you and I have a lot of areas of interest that intersect. Uh, and I'm not just talking about your large eclectic uh, collection of knives with menace. I do notice a lot of your knives have menace, uh, yeah. but, but also Kali and uh, photography and all these other things. So, uh, well, let's just start with a quick pocket check. Dave, I know you were carrying something today. Uh, what was it? I guess I'll have to reach in the pocket to find out, right? <laughs> oh, look at that. Spyderco Amalgam. It's been with me pretty regularly these days. Um, I put the, uh, what is it, MXG clip on it? Mm -hmm. Titanium clip. I like deep carry. Um, it's got the carbon fiber over G10 that a lot of people don't really love. I don't mind. Give us some good traction. And it is a, um, Brandon, Brendan Lai, I believe, design. That, uh, knife made a big splash. I remember when it came out maybe two years ago, something like that. I have not yet experienced it, uh, but I know that the flipper and the, um, and the, uh, compression lock thing is yeah that, that that's a little bit of a yeah <laughs> a little bit of a problem so i'm thinking of sending it down to bj hill and oh. have him do a, a flipper tab delete he does some really great work I, I like the stuff he does so dave how'd you get into this how did you get this love of knives i mentioned the martial arts but there must be something deeper where'd this come from um i was born overseas in um on okinawa hmm. the family brought back um they helped to reconstruct the island after world war ii so it gives you a little sense of my age um <laughs> <laughs> i uh they brought back a lot of uh, memorabilia different um you know lacquerware and uh carvings and uh, i wish i still had it um i had a tanto that was made out of a bayonet Ooh. But they had taken a bayonet and reground it completely, put it in a red lacquered handle, and, you know, it becomes a stick, right, mm -hmm. when the two halves go together. Right. And I had that kicking around for a while. You know, the funny thing is with my collecting, and, again, I just had a 
immense interest in Asian cultures. I started uh, judo training in the early 60s. Followed that with uh, Kyokushin Kai karate training. Uh, got a black belt eventually in about um, 67 before I went out to the West Coast to go to uh, fine arts and photography school. So um, how's that for eclectic? <laughs> That's pretty eclectic. So you got out to California. Uh, uh, what that is the that is the promised land in the United States for martial arts. What uh, what did you do once you got there in terms of martial arts? Um, I studied um, Goju Karate from another guy uh, that I ran into out there at the University of California. I, I, that's not where I was going. Um, and uh, eventually ended up at a very interesting little school in Goleta, California, by the name of the Cultural School. I had a $400 uh, Volkswagen that I picked up. Somebody had spray painted it gold, turned to brown. It was a 1959 Volkswagen. I remember because there was no gas gauge and you had to reach down on the floor when you ran out of gas and flip this manual lever that put you on reserve. Oh, cool. And they gave me magnetic signs. There's a, a cute little couple, um, Ken and Mie Ota, uh, very well known uh, throughout California for ballroom dancing. They were ballroom dancing champions. So it was referred to as the cultural school, judo, aikido, and ballroom dancing. <laughs> nice. And uh, in the evening, they had the mats out, the tatami. During the day, they pulled the mats up and they taught ballroom dancing on a beautiful parquet floor. That's uh, that's not surprising to me actually. When you <laughs> when you think of Aikido and the movements, uh, the the footwork of Aikido kind of seems like dancing a little bit. And um, well, Bruce Lee was a cha 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 uh, right. champion, right. so uh, it seems to be that the martial arts and dancing has a bit of a crossover. Well, um, so I learned Aikido. It really was the plus for me, and a bigger plus in 1970. I got to meet Koichi Tohei who at the time was 10th Don and head of World Aikido. Hmm. He was visiting for a month, and I got to train with him for a few weeks. In fact, he uh, signed one of his books for me. I cherish that. It's called uh, Aikido in Daily Life. Hmm. And he was very much the same as my sentiments about the martial arts is blending philosophy with, um, with the art. And uh, very much like the founder of Aikido, uh, Morie Ushiba, who was a real enigma. I mean, you talk about Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee would put people down and say, ah, technique's no good. This is, you're no good. That's no good. And, you know, he challenged people to, to prove it and he, he'd prove it. Uh, somebody asked him about Morei Ushiba. He, he said, he's not from this planet. Wow. And he, so, Morei so Ushiba was that good. He got I mean, the respect of Bruce Lee, so you're you're saying he's uh... he he was mystical good. He, there were stories about him um, fending off somebody that came at him with a pistol, oh my. and somebody who attacked him in his garden with a samurai sword. I, okay, don't take this the wrong way. Uh, I I did a little <laughs> bit of a keto, uh, just a little bit to be uh, to get my butt kicked with it, I guess. Uh, but it kind of seems, in a way, like you need some mysticism to make aikido work. In the modern world, anyway, because it's yeah. you know I know it is an art. It's not necessarily the combative form of the aiki thing. Aikijutsu. Yeah. Aikijutsu. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, kind of kind of seems like uh, a, a mystical guy like that could make something like aikido really work. Well, you don't meet force with force. You learn that. Mm -hmm. And um, my whole upbringing up to that point in martial arts was to meet force with force. When you study uh, Kyokushin Kai karate, that was Oyama's karate. Hmm. And he uh, he killed bulls with his bare hands. <laughs> <laughs> so how it, was that it, training with him? Was, was that the kind of place where you can expect to get hurt and that's part of it? Oh, yeah. Well, I trained in the style. I didn't train directly under him. He was the head of the style. But I trained in New York City on and off from hmm. a couple of Japanese uh, fellas that uh, – didn't much like us Westerners and felt we were soft. So they did everything they could to prove how soft we were. So I remember going to New York for my black belt test and uh, 
do your best form, do your favorite form. And everybody was doing uh, tension forms and hardening the stomach. They just came right along, popped them in the solar plexus, and they were dropping one, two, three, right down the line. And um, it came from my turn. I did a soft, quick form so that nobody could test my abdomen. <laughs> <laughs> That's a smart And thinking. I survived. I survived. So uh, you also um, owned some martial arts schools? I owned a school called White Lotus Martial Arts Center, and we did um, Kung Fu, Tai Chi, and uh, eventually Kali. And we had uh, we taught the Pikiti, Cert Pikiti, Pikiti Tercia, I can't say that word, mm -hmm. Pikiti Tercia style, um, which is Leo Gahe style. And I was very fortunate to train under um, Leo Gahe for... Uh, I think about a month altogether mm -hmm. directly and um, then under Bill McGrath from New York, uh, which he was a senior student. And uh, having Leo basically camping out at my school for a month was a very interesting thing. Well, let me, let me, I, I want to hear why. Um, <laughs> let me, let me tell you my impression of Leo guy. He came once to the school I used to train at um, and gave a, you know, it was like a Saturday seminar, like a six hour thing or whatever. And he was in his eighties at the time. I think he still is if he's not in his nineties yet. Yep. And, um, he had, uh, forearms like suspension cables from a bridge. I mean, he, unbelievable. And, uh, we were, he was showing us all these, uh, very aggressive knife techniques and, um, it was a lot of fun. And I was training with someone who was, uh, a lot newer at it than I and he wasn't quite getting it. So Gahe, yeah. Leo Gahe came over to me to, to, to us to show my partner on me. And it was an amazing feeling, I got to say, uh, because I, I just completely surrendered myself uh, to him um, in that it was a grappling thing. And I found myself on the ground, you know, eating a mat with my arm behind my, you know, yeah. in some contorted position. But he did it very gently, but very, yeah. very, I felt like he could have snapped me in half at any moment. And and he was an yeah. elderly man. His power is very soft, but very uh, steel-like, as you're describing. So um, what we used to say about the, um, the Tai Chi masters is it's like steel wrapped with cotton. Nice. So steel you, wrapped with cotton. Yeah. Yeah. It's soft on the outside, but it's totally... Um, irresistible on the inside, you know, the, the amount of strength that they have. And that includes the Aikido people as well. It's what they call, you know, bringing out the chi or bringing out the ki. But uh, Mr. Uh, Gahe, Grand Tuhan Gahe had it in spades. And uh, I remember doing a live knife tapping session with him. We had, he said, ah, enough of these plastic knives and rubber knives. And he opens up his ballet song that I had given him, by the way, uh, one of the original Benchmade Ballet songs, Hand Ground by Jody Sampson. It was a double edge with a white micarta handle on it. I remember that. And it was latchless. Um, and he starts out slow. And I'll, I have to tell you, training with a live knife coming at you. And he didn't cut me once, which I thank him for. Gets Gives you 100% of your attention on what's happening. It's just, there's no, there's no substitute for it. It's kind of like when people tell you about, you know, traumatic events that happen in their lives and they remember every little second of what happened. It's it, the same thing because, I mean, I wasn't looking to the side. I wasn't looking up. I wasn't looking down. I had my eyes right on basically the center of his body, which is where you need to look. You don't follow the knife around. You look dead center, mass of the body. And, um, uh, I learned a lot. Um, tre tremendous skill. He sort of combined what I learned in Aikido, what I'd learned in karate, what I'd learned in Kung Fu, all together into this beautiful synthesis. And the nice thing is it's an art I can still do today, mm -hmm. whereas I can't do a lot of the Kung Fu stuff that requires you to jump up in the air and spin and you know, go down on the uh, on the floor and do a spinning top and, and and whatnot. As much as there are those Shaolin masters who can do that, right, in right, right. advanced years. Well, I haven't I, met any of them personally. <laughs> right. Well, they could be lying about their age. <laughs> um, I I remember hearing a story uh, when I lived in New York City about a guy, an elderly gentleman who is in a fast food place, um, and 
some you know scumbag came up to him and 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 started hassling him i don't remember exactly what the guy did he assaulted him in some way the dude pulls out a sword cane and chops off one of his hands wow. you know disappears into the night and wow. to me it, that says two things um one don't mess with old guys and and two uh knife arts blade arts are something that you can carry into your uh older adult years because you're using an extension of your body. It's really, it's your body that starts to go as you get older. Right. Um, and any sort of help you can get with that, with an right. implement, uh, such as a knife or a sword cane is going to help you. And this martial art uh, can, can take you into your adult years, you know? Oh yeah. And that's, I find Kali to be that, you know, you can, use a cane or a stick or a knife or, or what have you, uh, should you need it. But, um, I mean, the way that, uh, Leo Gahe trained was that at six years old, he was put up on a tabletop and his grandfather would try to hit his toes with a stick. And that's how he learned footwork is to get your feet out of the way because the feet are a target too. Yeah. In, in Filipino martial arts, whether with, uh, somebody trying to cut him with a, with a sharp uh, implement or, or strike them with a stick. So you learn the footwork first and then you learn um, stick and, and sword and the stick and the sword translates to the empty hand. So once you learn the weapon, it's the reverse in Kung Fu, you learn empty hand and then you learn the weapon in uh, Filipino, you learn the weapon and then you learn the empty hand. So, yeah. And the, and the empty hand follows very logically uh, from, uh, you know, I've done a little bit of, well, I did, I did some Pan and Tukin while I was doing, uh, Kali and, and all of those techniques, the destructions and the, and the, uh, well, the various ways of approaching the footwork's the same, the angles are the same. Um, it's just brutal. And, and of the fact that it follows a weapon system is unique. It's like karate. You gotta, you gotta train years and years and years. And then finally they put a bow staff in your hand or something like that. Yeah. Of course I'm exaggerating, but, um, well, a lot of it's muscle memory. I mean, there's things I haven't practiced for years that when I think of them and connect the body, I can do them. Uh, maybe not with the same force. And one thing you have to watch out is that muscle memory. If you haven't done something in a number of years and then you try to do it full out, mm -hmm. first thing you do is pull something out of, out of whack. But I wanted surprised. to see what uh, what color uh, uh, sling you're wearing today. It's blue. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you should see the group of guys that jumped me. They're all in the hospital now. Just kidding. It I hope you're hiding a knife up in there now. <laughs> oh, my God. Funniest thing. I got this sling, and I was like, hey, baby, guess what? My wife's like, you're not putting a knife in there. I'm like... That's, that's a great, you know <laughs> that's a great place for like a, you know, six inch Tonto or something. Yeah, it is. Uh, that's yeah. pretty much where they, uh, they kept it in their kimono, right? Yeah. So, um, your, your martial arts schools, um, you had it for, you know, in the seventies and the eighties and the nineties, was this the time when you started collecting, uh, in earnest? Well, that's, um, not Ernest Emerson, but I did have a few of his things. Uh, <laughs> wah, bad, wah. Joke, bad joke. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, by the way, never met Ernest, but uh, I, I saw a lot of him in his training films and so forth. And I had a few of his pieces, but uh, the interesting thing about my collecting, and I thought about this before coming on, is that uh, it has been through cycles. I started uh, collecting things um, fairly seriously, but not in great number. in I would say the uh, late 60s, one of the... One of the pieces I wish I'd kept, which would be worth thousands today, was something I picked up at a hardware store for 40 bucks, was a John Nelson Cooper uh, dagger. Oh. And you may or may not know who John Nelson Cooper is or was, but he was a founding member of the uh, Knife Makers Guild along with Loveless and, and those guys. So he was from that era. Right. In fact, he might have even preceded Loveless, but he was also the mentor to Jody Sampson, the sword maker to the stars, who was oh, the... Yeah. yeah. Jody hand ground all the Bally Song blades for Lestiasis. 
So uh, uh, at the when it was Pacific Knife Company, is that what it was? It was called? Bally Song Company. Bally Song Company. Okay, so so yeah. pre proto Benchmade, basically. Late seventies, he incorporated his Bally Song Company, and they were um, in Burbank, California. And uh, in the early eighties, when he became, uh, he moved. That's right. He stayed in Burbank. In the early 80s, I would just pick up the phone and talk to them. I'd run the martial arts school. I was buying a number of ballet songs, selling them. Uh, these were the original ballet songs that were milled out of a billet of stainless steel and uh, pinned. They were permanently attached. No screws like today's ballet songs. Right. No bearings. It was, uh, I think there was a, a sleeve in which, inside which a pin rode. Okay. The you could have any kind of scales you wanted. They basically dovetailed slots into the handles and those were slid in. And then the whole handle was contoured and made one. Uh, you could, I could order them up with a latch or without a latch. I preferred latchless because uh, we carried them in what was called a cocoon, mm -hmm. a horizontal ballistic nylon sheath uh, that was very convenient. You could learn to peel open the, um, the flap with two fingers, keep on going with pull the ballet song out and flip it open with a in a reverse a, grip in a, 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 a pot call grip. So, uh, but again, I you know the 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 thing I wanted to say was that my knife collecting has been through cycles. I got into it, gave it up, got into it, gave it up, got into it, gave it up. Had it been a continuum. I'd still have a lot of that stuff and I wouldn't have sold it or given it away. Mm. Now what I'm collecting, I, I mean, it, you can't keep up with it. There's so many, there's Civivi's coming out with a model a week and, you know, Kaiser's coming out with a model a week. And uh, I think the whole YouTube channel thing is you almost get a little anxious because you're saying, well, so-and-so did the review on that knife that just yeah. came out last week. I didn't get to do the review yet. You know, but I'm getting to the point where, you know, you can't keep up with that race. And there are guys out there. I'm turning out a video a day. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I do it. Um, I, I think I posted that out as a comment on Nick Shabazz's site. And he said, you know, even the, the so-called pros don't turn out a, a video a day. And I've been doing it for six months or more. But, um, you know, so I try to get new things in. But, um it's hard keeping up with that. So what I do is try to group things together and uh, look at what I have and say, you know, here's some small folders. Here's some large folders. Here's some knives by Kaiser. Here's some knives, you know, best of kind of a thing. And interestingly enough, uh, I get almost more views on those than I do on a single knife. Well, first of all, people love collection videos. I, I myself love collection videos. But yeah. but I, back to a point you were mentioning before about uh, I know what you're talking about uh, concerning the anxiety of being the first one to get that knife. And yeah. I, 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 excuse me, that was part of my instinct very early on. But I realized that's just not um, that's not me. I'm not that interested in um, all of the new knives coming out that people want to see. Um, you know, all the new spider codes and stuff like that. So to me, that's a job best left up to Slicey and Metal Complex and and some of the other guys who who are really oh, yeah. you know, have their finger on the pulse. And I love that. And and that's some, um, you know, besides their charm and insight, that's why I watch their videos to check out what everything new is. Um, but what I love about your channel and what I kind of uh, uh, go for in my channel is you don't see too many uh, videos about the knives you show. You don't see too many right. videos about the knives I show. So there are others out there who want to see those. So how many videos to see about one of these? Yeah, exactly. That's that Max Venom weirdness, isn't it? Yeah. I love that. It's a crazy knife. It is a crazy knife. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to hold it and open it. It's a button lock. Um, I don't hold on to it because I carry it. I hold on to it because it's an, uh, kind of an oddity and yeah. I think they're out of production on it. <clears throat> and well, um, well, that, that's, that's uh, another thing you have to clear up with your own collection or one has to clear up with their own collection is what kind of, you know, collection do you want to have? I do have for a while. It, I, I felt like it was the DeMarco museum of knives. I had to have one example of every kind of unique thing out there. 
And then right. I realized that like, I'll be doing this forever and I'll be broke and I won't be carrying any of these. So what's the point? Yeah. You know? Well, I'm, I'm reaching critical mass. Uh, you know, I've, I've got way too many at this point. What, what does that so, mean? Uh, you want to count? You want a number? Yeah. If you have one, um, I'd Maybe. say somewhere in the 250 range. 250. Okay. I think you're beyond me. Uh, does that include swords, folders, everything? No. No, oh. that's just, in fact, that's a, a lot of uncatalogued two sons as well oh. that are, are not even in that number. So wow. there's two sons. I have to ask people who are more two son experts, mm -hmm. uh, what number is this? Because they don't have names, yeah. you know, and I cannot remember the numbers. I got to, I can look back on places like eBay and right. say, you know, l let me look back and see when I got this and Sometimes they just give you the little, you know, it's cut off and you don't see the whole name and so forth. But yeah, so uh, I, I've been donating some. I've been uh, sending them out for review to, to guys with channels like uh, Dirk Werning. Mm -hmm. You know, he's uh, reviewed a lot of my stuff. So uh, and, uh, you know, if I find that he likes something, you know, I'll say, well, you know, hang on to it. And um same thing with your channel. So. Yeah, yeah. As you you've donated six knives to our channel, uh, and uh, uh, I mean, great probably knives more, too. Probably more coming. Oh, you know, okay. Right. Yeah, I, you see no. anything tonight that you like? You just let me know. <laughs> uh, all those Filipino <laughs> stores behind you. I'll just, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but but the knives you sent uh, uh, are all well six very high quality knives, and we had a we gave a couple of them out on the Patreon uh, giveaways and. Um, auctioned one off and for charity. And we're going to do some of that right. again with these. And, and, and that, you know, you, you, you reach a certain point. It's like, I could, I could try to sell some of these um, or I could give them to people who want them. And in a, in a sense, like I, I could never understand that when I was a newer collector, but now I totally get it. You know, it's like, right. uh, I, yeah. Here's something interesting. It doesn't look like much. Hmm. Now this this started life as a live blade that probably had a flaw, so they turned it into what they call a butter knife. But can you read that? Mm, Japan. Uh, oh, Pacific Cutlery Corporation. So that's an early North Hollywood, California. Oh my gosh! And that is uh, the Kuzan Oda Tanto. I looked this up before the uh, the podcast to see if I could find one. Three hundred and fifty dollars on eBay for a live one. Wow! And all this is is a cast aluminum handle. I happen to put the uh, silicone tape over it for grip. But uh, you know, this is what we use for our uh, for our practice. So, did you have a bunch of those? Did all of your students? Carry I have those? a pair. I, have, oh, I had two. As far as I can, and, you know, I'd sold other things, too, that were called butter knives, uh, Bally songs included, where they'd grind off the tip and so forth. But um, now we've got cool stuff like this. Oh, yeah. The Lucha Trainer. And it's beautiful because it's every bit like the Lucha, and you don't cut yourself. <laughs> so you can, you can try out all your tricks. So, Dave, how would you like? How would you characterize your collection in general? Eclectic, yeah, eclectic. But you know, I think uh, I've I've held on to a lot of stuff, but uh, it seems like my sweet spot are the higher end knives by We hmm. and uh, Best Tech and some of the Reich knives. Uh, that seems to be where I settle in. Um, although artisan has some really excellent mm -hmm. stuff as well. And there's a few of those. Um, uh, I think the, uh, Ray Laconico one that you were showing the, um, the, uh, what the heck is it? Centauri. Oh, that yes. Yeah. Oh man. I wish that were mine. I was like, I don't have any Ray Laconicos. That was a, a, yeah. a borrowed knife. Uh, but so, okay. So you have an eclectic, I'm trying to get to something here, which is, what do you, what influence, what influence do you think your martial arts and your Kali had on your collecting today? I mean, is it, is it all, is it all martial blades? I like a big blade in a folder. 
uh, I like uh, at least 3.75 to four and a quarter. One of my favorite knives is the Blocal, the Wheat Blocal. It's just a big knife. And, and I would aspire to get a custom at some point by uh, Miguel Barbudo. And um, Miguel, a few months ago or maybe a year ago, didn't have much of a name, but now he is the head guy at Forged in Fire uh, Latin America. Oh, if, is he the you, host? I, I believe he is. I haven't seen the show, okay. but I know Doug Markaida gave him his blessings and kind of started him off. But if you look on Instagram at some of Miguel uh, Barbudo's uh, folders and some of his uh, Damascus and some of his fixed blades, it's all in that Spanish tradition, you know, with that point that narrows down and goes out like that, kind of like the blocal. Do you happen to have the blocal near nearby? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, of course. It's one of your favorites, you said. Well, let's see. It's always the heaviest. I I pick up these pouches and I say, well, which one is it? And it's always the heaviest one. <laughs> Yeah, this this knife, uh, man, that really gets my heart racing. I've never seen or or uh, or held it, but it has a unique lock, doesn't it? Uh, it's the, a window like a lock. They refer to it as a window lock. Let's see, right there. So I see if I can get that a little closer to the oh, camera. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah. So that tab right there, when you open it. Yeah. Snaps in there. And I'm not going to make any great claims and uh, say it's better than cold steel, but I'll, I'll bet you it's every bit as uh, resilient to closing uh, accidentally, you know, with back pressure. Yeah. For those who don't know the Blackout or aren't watching and are only listening, this uh, this looks like a back lock mixed with uh, a it's on, it's on bearings. Ooh, nice. So what people don't like about it, and there have been some reviewers that have called it a dangerous knife, is that if you press on the back lock and you're holding it here, it's going to drop on your fingers. It's just going to release. Right. See? And then what you have to do is squeeze it, and then that's the detent. So the... The window lock is also the detent as well as the uh, locking open. I I really like that knife. I like that Spanish clip point, you know, yeah. that look. So, but, so now, okay, eclectic. How do you take all of these different knives with all of these um, different characteristics and put them through the same bit of testing? Like, how do you... Uh, test a knife, what do you consider a good knife, and how do you judge them all when they're all so different? I tend to like, if I use this as an example again, yeah. I like a knife that adapts to the Filipino arts, which means that I tend not to like knives that have um, crescent handles. The exception would be the karambit, of course, but I like the knife to be straight so that when I hold it in a square grip, which is what we like to use in Piketty Tercia, and to be able to put the thumb on the back of the blade, doesn't matter if it's got jimping or not, in that the um, you have the five, six, and nine. If you study the, uh, you probably know what those angles are. Those about, are angles right? of attack. Yep. Right. So you have, that's your nine. Or that's your nine, and that's your uh, boy. I'm losing the numbers now, but doesn't really matter. Straight yeah. ahead, straight ahead is five. Um, then we got the angle in from the top, and then we got the the angle coming in from here. So, but but the thing is that you know it it should feel um, balanced enough so that it's it turns easily in the wrist. Because you can come in here, you can cut, you can come in here, you can cut, you come in here, and you can cut. So it's a thrust, turn, cut, yeah. right? And we won't describe what's going on there, but it might, well, be, so, ev it might be evident. <laughs> yeah. So with that curved crescent-shaped handle, the point is not where you want it to be, especially on no. like that backhanded thrust, or is that is that what you're getting at? The, there are some hand there are some handles that 
place it in a uh, in more of a saber grip. Okay, I and I, I I, I got to sort of contort my wrist to to show you, but uh, where it lies, let's see, this way mm -hmm. in the hand instead of this way. Interesting. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with this, right? It's kind of like a European fencer's grip. But um, the the style that I studied likes the square grip. I'm um, certainly it doesn't mean you can't angle it mm -hmm. in a, in a moment. But we also do a lot of these uh, flicks. So your your jab would be would be presented that way with a loose wrist, firm grip, mm -hmm. and deliver deliver that point. You do the same thing in uh, point down. So you, you would jab this way, right? And then there are ways to get greater extension and range and so on and so forth. But I would say that good ergo is something that fills the hand. But, you know, I make exceptions to that just based on um, aesthetics. So here's something that uh, I did a review on that will be out uh, wow. tomorrow. This is a really weird knife by yeah. Max DeChuck. And this is called the Lucky Star. It's by Concept. Oh. And he came out with a previous model with the same blade that was blackened that he called the Prickle. Oh, so, yeah. So this is a high-end Prickle, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> that blade is insane. <laughs> Don't, this is a high-end Prickle. D describe that blade. That's, that is a weird – that's like a drop point tanto. What is it, that? It, it is – uh, tanto on steroids, I guess. It, it's got it's got a very uh, severe forward angle, but then he clips the point. But it's interesting here is it is a straight knife, and you've got a point that's on line with the axis of the blade. Mm. It's it's not a particularly long one. I think it's three and a half inches or so. Uh, the holes are completely style they don't serve any real function um it's on bearings just came in today not too drop shutty it's a front flipper um front flippers aren't high on my uh, list of uh knives that at least for me are easy to deploy they're very polarizing a lot of people think they're yeah. kind of an answer to a problem that never existed that's another front flipper that I actually find, I'll call it an end flipper. Yeah. That's a, a real steel, uh, Epon, that was designed by uh, Chad Los Banos from Hawaii. He's a um, martial arts guy and a law enforcement officer. And this, nice thing about this, can be used as an impact. Hmm. Pain uh, compliant. Break. Pain compliance, glass breaker, but it's very easy to uh, to flip it open. Place your hands up in front of a camera, and it's it's kind of a um, Japanese influence design. Yeah, it looks like a kind of a quaken sort of thing. Uh, yeah, quaken. But yeah, I um, I brought a lot of talking points. I call them tonight <laughs> oh that's good uh before we started rolling i was talking about commenting about the swords behind you those are from a company called traditional filipino martial arts we had ron kazakowski on the show quite a while ago uh he's the guy uh who owns and runs uh that company and he's also a connecticut he's a pikiti tertia teacher also right i mean he's a, he, i know he's he a is, colleague guy but he is i've been to a number of leo guy guy seminars at his school so uh yeah, he's down in Waterbury. He's not far from me. So yeah. you did all the photography for, I mean, it's beautiful photography for his uh, website and catalog, right? Uh, since you mention it, there's his catalog, and those are my my picks. So when you went out to California for fine art school, you went out for photography. Right. And so now, years later, you're bringing them. Well, I guess you've been you, you've been working with him for a while. But this whole idea of starting your own channel and and bringing some of your ho not hobbies, your passions together, knives, photography. In this case, it's videography, but um, sharing your knowledge of uh, you know 
martial arts application to these knives that you're collecting. Um, is, is that, was that part of the goal in starting this channel? Um, yeah, I think it was a, a passion of being able to talk about the blades, being able to collect them, obviously, uh, being able to experience new styles as they came out uh, and incorporate the photography. I'd been, um, I spent 10 years as a advertising photographer mm -hmm. uh, out of school, uh, basically doing what was called nuts and bolts photography. And that means industrial photography. So I would be inside uh, factory plants and we'd be setting up shops and uh, shots rather. And they'd be keying in on, you know, a particular safety device or a light or some wire. I had to bring electrical fittings home to my studio, which happened to be at my parents' house at the time and make the, uh, make them look sexy. You know, some, some big casting yeah. that, that, was you know screwed on to the end i mean this giant cable um container and you know it, it, you put, put a mug of beer next to it and make it flow over and <laughs> all these little <laughs> tricks uh, plastic ice cubes you know yeah. that's hilarious this is like uh make this spool of wire sexy to the guy who needs it Ooh, yeah, maybe so, I could have a beer after I use it. <laughs> I figured if I could make the electrical fittings look sexy, I can make knives look sexy. So, absolutely, uh, I enjoy the lighting and uh, you know setting up the shots and using different backgrounds. And uh, although the the funny thing is, is you kind of get into uh, mass production of um, these um, these uh, videos for reviews. Uh, I find myself, you know, I'll leave the same background there, leave the lights the same way, you know, <laughs> there's no time to change all that stuff. Let's, you know, let's do the review. But so what I'm thinking of doing and is basically cutting back a little bit and maybe doing three videos a week, something like that, where I got a little more time to spend um, making them the way I want to make them mm -hmm. and um, not having to, uh, to churn them out and, and not jumping on every, uh, you know, new knife, uh, every new flash in the bucket, so to speak, because, uh, hey, you know, Civivis are great knives, but they're here today. And a year from now, you may not even know what the model was, or maybe you do, because there's some people that are really hot Civivi yeah. collectors. So, but they just have so many models. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You know what? You know what I would submit. Um, you're, you're talking about everything being the same, and and how uh, part of if you go to uh, three videos uh, a week, part of it's going to be to change it up a little bit. Um, but I would suggest that in um, that as a rabid knife review video watcher, as I'm sure you are, uh, I can really there's a shorthand to um, to the uh, what do you call it the thumbnail. You know, I can always yep. tell whose thumbnail is whose. And now I know yours, but you've said, you know, your, your style is distinctive. And uh, so if you change, I would suggest that you keep the thumbnails distinctive. Oh, no, yeah. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Because, man. No, oh, yeah, that, yeah. I, you know, the lighting's probably going to stay about the same. I think I've got it worked out. Um, you know, we would spend years. And I have to say, um, the guy I really, really admire i can't say enough about his work and you know who i'm gonna whose name mm -hmm. i'm gonna throw out there is sharp by coop yeah and um his photography is equal or better to and i'm trying to remember the guy's name who did the knives illustrated catalog shots mm -hmm. every year every year knives illustrated would come out and there'd be that big thick uh journal of knives we're talking like 80s, I think. And the name Ken Warner sticks in my mind, but I believe he was the editor and not the photographer. Anyway. So that's are you talking about the big book that comes out every year? That I haven't seen it in years, but okay. I used to get it. Yeah, I used to buy it on the magazine shelf in the store. Yeah, I used to go to Barnes & Noble in New York and yeah. kill time looking at that. Yeah. Awesome. To Until they told you, sir, are you going to buy that or read it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd say, I don't know. You're going to ask that guy who's sleeping over there on a bunch of books? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so when you get a new knife and you know you want to review it, you know you want to put it on video, what is the process you go through um, to determine whether it's good or not? And do you do videos of knives that you don't find good? Oh, absolutely. And I, I do videos of knives that are just 
interesting that that have hit the public, uh, have hit social media and whatnot. And, and that's where I say, you know, a certain amount of restraint needs to be exercised. Um, I do a fair amount of business with uh, White Mountain Knives, and he's really good about getting stuff to you quick. And I know a lot of other YouTubers use him as well. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it's you have to say, I think eventually, is this, is this going to fit in my collection? And uh, it, I'm in the midst right now of narrow, narrowing down the collection and you know, I don't uh, currently don't own any customs, so it's all uh, production stuff. So I haven't gone into that extreme realm where you know guys are throwing out uh, all this money for custom knives, and you know maybe ultimately that's the thing to collect. Just like people that collect watches are, mm -hmm. you know, going for everything from Timex to Rolex and and beyond. By the way, my timepiece is uh, smartwatch. <laughs> My timepiece is sitting on my dresser because of this stupid sling. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, 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 the trends that you see are they are they things that compel you to buy a knife? Um, well, you had a front flipper up. If we want to talk about trends, I mean, I said polarizing yeah. trend. There's nothing quite like a front flipper to get uh, a knife nerd. You know, get his the front, the front flipper. The, the front flipper doesn't see a lot of uh, a lot of pocket time looking for something else i'll tell you what i'm uh, fairly enamored with because they're at a good price point and um, they seem to be knocking it out of the park lately is max ace Ooh. and that's the sand sandstorm k now, Dave, what, what is that thing on the side? Is that a rotary lock of some sort? A secondary rotary lock? That's exactly what it is. Huh. So you twist that and it locks out the, uh, the liner. And uh, so far it hasn't engaged on its own. But it's, uh, they really did a great job sculpting the uh, G10. Um, this emulates a higher end piece that they sell for like 400, I think. Mm -hmm. And this is coming in around a hundred or maybe a little over a hundred. But um, earlier I had the amalgam out, which has nearly a four inch blade. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, hold them up. Let's see. Let's see if oh. I can get them back here. Oh, that's nice. It dwarfs the amalgam. Yep. So yeah, it's a, it is a large uh, hand filling knife and uh, Max A seems to be coming out with quite a few of these lately. So you, I like it. You mentioned customs a moment ago and, and I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm not, I'm not a mathematician, but I'm thinking about the numbers you said of folders that you have and you know, the relative amounts that they cost you. I'm wondering if you could reduce part of your production catalog and start for the, for us, for the good of everyone yeah. who watches your channel. <laughs> no, uh, I'm yeah. just kidding. But, but you could, this is how I, I have four custom knives, three custom knives, I think three or four. Yeah. And that's, that's what I ended up doing. I sold a, a, a bunch to fund each one. And um, that's I, likely going to happen. I mean, that that's likely going to happen. I think the thing with production knives is, um, if you make a mistake, it's not a big one. If you, you get a really expensive um, custom knife that you think you thought you like. Yeah. And you get it in your hand and, you know, maybe it doesn't function the way you wanted it to. It doesn't feel the way the ergos aren't right uh, or whatever. Um, yeah, certainly it probably retains value better than the production knife. So if you found an interested buyer, you could get rid of it. Yeah, well, that's true. You find some some uh, dyed in the wool collector of a certain uh, certain maker, and then you can probably unload it. Yeah, um, but yeah, I started with uh, custom fixed blades. I started. I, I mean, I only have, like I said, I have four. I have two fixed blades that are custom, and two folder folders that are custom. And I, without, I love them all. I like the fixed blades better. I got to say the. Um, the folders are are very good, high quality, no doubt. Uh, but but maybe there was a little bit of that thing you mentioned where I was like, God, I really. 
But I realized once I got it, this is the first one I got, which I still really love and I will never get rid of. It was for sentimental reasons. It was someone I interviewed on the show. It was a model I'd, I'd been admiring for a long time. And uh, then when I got it, I was like, this is awesome. This is cool. Put it in the case. You know, I never yeah. carry it. Never. And uh, it's not because I'm afraid to. It's because it's, it's, it's more of a showpiece. Well, very frequently something will come in. I review it, take a look at it, play with it. Uh, in some cases, um, you know, maybe loosen the pivot, get it smoothed up, do a review on it, and then goes in the drawer, and I don't see it for a while. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, I, and and that's that's a fact. So uh, I, I think getting something more it, interesting story real quick about um, custom knives. Back in the 70s, when I was studying Kung Fu under a well-known grandmaster uh, in the Northeast, um, this guy that ran a series of schools in Pennsylvania, um, I mean, he, he had a lot of schools, uh, successful as well. We decided um, because the teacher relocated to Florida, we'd visit him in Florida, but we'd stop at Randall Knives. So we drove his uh, old Lincoln Continental from uh, Pennsylvania down to uh, Orlando, Florida, drove down this old swamp road to what looked like a shack in a small house. And that was Randall Knives. And there was a small showcase, nothing ostentatious um, out front, you know, had a few of the models in there. Uh, so not everything, even at that time, was available to just purchase. Yeah. But he bought a couple. I bought a small uh, boot dagger. So on a, again, I don't have them. Mm. I had a custom Terzola Sorry. Oh, God. that my students bought for me. It was a Chris. It was a custom. It was made. Wait, wait, wait. Your students bought it for you and you got rid of it? Yeah, well. Dave, you've got a cold <laughs> heart, my friend. <laughs> oh, my God. Knife's a knife. It's yeah. Cold steel. Cold steel. <laughs> but it, the thing I didn't like about it at the time, and there's no, you know, nothing on Bob. Yeah. And I had a few of Bob's knives um, that I bought through uh, a guy, Doug Kenefick, who is a big uh, Randall knife dealer yeah. up in Connecticut. Uh, you go into his, oh, you go to his house and you would see. 200 Randalls in the case amongst other Crawfords and yeah. all kinds of stuff. Uh, he even had the Sasquatch Bowie made. That was his design. Oh. It was a weird recurve. Yeah. Uh, that Sasquatch Bowie was Doug Kenefick's uh, design that Randall made. Uh, but at any rate, you know, we went down to this little place. Very Everybody's all relaxed there. I talked to you for a while. Uh, a little bit of a Southern drawl going on. I don't think I met Bo Randall. I think I met his son. But, you know, we bought our stuff and went on our way. But uh, that was my uh, my one time visiting uh, Randall Knives. Well, you mentioned uh, to me uh, a while back that you worked with Norm Bardsley, a uh, uh, a knife designer or a knife maker, custom yes, knife maker. Rhode Island. Yep. And, and uh, you ended up actually designing a knife? Um, there was a Kali knife that I had designed and to tell you the truth, the design, uh, exactly what it was escapes me. I know we were looking for a small Pakal knife at the time. This was preceding anything that was commercially available. Um, uh, we were looking for like a three inch Bill McGrath always said he really liked a three inch double edge for a, an ideal, um, uh, uh, Pakal knife because no matter how you rolled it, no matter how it was in the hand, it was you know always in the right position. That's the thing about a double edged knife, right? Yeah, it's like that ice dagger I did the review on by oh, Tops yeah. recently. Uh, yeah. No matter how you roll it, that, that comes very close to those the, the right qualifications because the Pakal knife is used uh, a lot for trapping hmm. and you know jabbing. Um, T tapping with your forearm, trapping, uh, using the, the blade as a hook, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not too many things at that time qualified, and things like the Gerber Mark II 
double-edged uh, Vietnam combat knife was too long. It was about a seven inch, as I recall, had one of those. Um, but we did finally have this knife, a prototype made. I don't know if it ever went into production. I don't know if we ever even sold any. Uh, I think uh, closest it came was like wood or plastic. But Norm Bargely used to make handles that looked like an alligator's mouth with the eye and the teeth out of ivory. And uh, he he made some real crazy stuff. He was out of uh, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, I believe. Pawtucket. And, I, uh, I looked uh, – I looked. I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, yeah. Dave. I, I looked him up and uh, – a, a very wide range of designs and styles from him. Some very fantasy looking stuff, some yeah. very, very business looking stuff. Yeah. And then, and then some like outdoor hunting kind of a very, yeah. To, to me, if I were a knife maker, I think I would be more like that, that the type of guy who on a certain day, I just feel like making a fantasy dagger. I'm going to do that. He, he was a regular stopping by the school as well. He made me some mm. sticks out of uh pocket wood. Ooh. You know, which is that compressed uh, wood and resin. Yeah. And so he, he made me some pretty heavy duty sticks, like a one inch diameter, 28 inches long. That thing feels like ironwood. But the only problem is if you hit it against something really hard, like steel or whatnot, it'll shatter. And it'll also vibrate up your arm. <laughs> right. I, this, um, speaking of sticks, this is a Giho stick that Ron Kozakowski sells. Oh, yeah. Um, and this Giho wood has, there's no finish on this. This is the waxy resin that comes up like lignum vitae. Mm, the hardest this, wood. This stuff will sink and it can be at the bottom of the ocean for 100 years. It comes up and it's not rotted or uh, depleted in any way. Wow. But uh, this is a great little exercise uh, tool, and uh, I put a little grip tape on here. But if you want to practice and uh, learn uh, stick and, and sword, that's the thing to practice with. Why? Because it's weighted at the at the front and gives you it's, know it's heavier, some... yeah. Okay, and it's it, better better than an axe handle. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and it looks like yeah, it looks like it would uh, have the effect. You know, uh, it, it's got a defined edge. It's octagonal. And, uh, yeah, when it hits, it hits with authority. Um, you know, I don't think a lead pipe would do much better. And, and it wheels a lot better. <laughs> so what other um, – I know you got tons of folders. You obviously have those cool Filipino swords behind you. Uh, what, other kind of, uh, what other kind of implements do you have? Hatchets, axes, uh, tomahawk kind of things? Uh, other? No, no tomahawks or axes. I did have a couple of rons. What's that? And um, the, a, a Igorot. Uh, axe. Oh, oh, the headhunting axe. Yes. Oh, yes. Geez. I had a couple of those. There's two different styles of those. And um, I still have a, um, I had a claymore, <laughs> Scottish big, claymore. Big giant sword. It was almost as tall as me. <laughs> I'm not professing to be extremely tall, but I, it was a, it was a good, it was just under six feet. And, um, I still have a, a Braveheart sword. Oh, so you have a thing for those big ass swords. Those are so well. They were novel at the time. I had to take photos of them, and what happened oh. in some cases was I took the photo, and you know, rather than pay me for the photo, I'd collect the sword until there was almost no place to put them anymore. And my wife said, "You got too many swords." And um, they ended up uh, getting sort of sold out. So I've probably got a half dozen or so left, including a sword cane and a spear. Oh, nice. The spear. So the spear, the spear is really nice. It's, uh, if you look at his website, it's called a Northern Spear. It's got an interesting knife-like uh, yes, head with a hook on the top and a belly on the bottom. So you could do some interesting stuff with that. Northern Spear. Some interesting stuff you say, Dave. Yeah. So so what are the I think the appropriate answer to your wife was um no, I don't have too many swords. We don't have enough house. <laughs> yeah, well, the sword so, room you know, needs to expand. Uh, in, for that reason a lot of this stuff is is going to need to, you know, find its way out of here uh, sooner or later. So uh 
I am whipping up some sales online and, and whatnot. Might do some YouTube sales. We'll see. So I've seen some uh, some success with that. So, uh, you know, got to narrow it down to probably, you know, a dozen production knives that I really like. And then we'll, we'll see. Maybe you'll get into some custom, into some customs. But, uh, and I think probably what I'll do is, you know, get into the pass around groups and some of those. And that way have exposure to more without having to commit to, uh, to, to purchasing it. So you're going to, you're going to pare down 250 some odd to a dozen yeah. of really, wow, that's, uh, that's admirable. I don't think I'm, I could do that, but <laughs> I'm selling you a hundred. So, Oh, okay. I'll take them. I'll take each one. <laughs> So what what you said cycles you're cyclical uh, I'm yeah. similar like I go through a slip joint phase and then a fixed and then a always in a tactical folder phase what do yeah. you think your next phase is and, and by the way my cycles have to do at least up to this point with being on and off collecting altogether oh. so I mean I I'd, I'd collect a few and when I had the martial arts school we were selling knives and martial arts merchandise so the bally songs kind of fit in again i pick up the phone call a bally song have less theosis on the line they would bs for about an hour i talked to the guys in the shop you know he I, he said well you know what kind of handles do you like and this and that so he basically custom build the knife for me over the phone a few weeks later i'd have it but um I got in and out of that. As I said, uh, I'd still have a lot of ballet songs around, although I sold a bunch to students, but I'd still have some around if I didn't drop out of that phase. So, you know, um, we'll see where I go from here. Like I have a lot of interests. Uh, Want to get back to doing some more drone flying and, you know, it was photography that got me into drone flying. Uh, I love the aerial perspective and what you can do. I've shot real estate and I've shot dragon boat races and, mm all kinds of interesting stuff, but I'm slowing down a little. So I got to, you know, I'm kind of, uh, parse my time out a little more wisely. Uh, yeah. Well, so what, what things are you looking forward to in knife in the knife world knives? What kind of things? Are, let me, let me get, I just got into Randall knives and, and I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to push myself back from, from that. Uh, but that's my, that's my recent infatuation. Do you go, do you get like that? Do you get infatuated with the. Oh yeah. Well, Max Ace has sort of got me for a while uh, because um, at least the ones that I'm uh, picking up lately are affordable. Um, this was, uh, you know, so I like stuff like this, right? Looks like a traditional Quaken. Yeah. And um, that's the Samurai. Um, that sort of stuff, when I see that, a uh, blade shape that interests me, when I see a handle that I know, uh, can be functional, um, I like it. I like exotic handle materials, you know, if it's a fancy wood or something, um, I might pick it up. Although it seems like most everything is either carbon fiber or G10, you know, if in, in my collection at this point or titanium, um, what I'm looking for next, um, I don't really know. It seems like when I see it, I know it, you know, um, just got to share something else quick, please. I was really infatuated by this design by best tech. It's a $50 knife. It's beautiful. That, I mean, the work they did on the fuller up the middle and you can get it in a blackened blade. You can get it with blackened with that fuller, uh, natural, it's got a deep carry clip. I'm a fanatic for deep carry clips. I don't really care for knives where they leave about an inch sticking out of your pocket. Mm -hmm. You know, I realize there's upsides and downsides to that. Uh, I mean, look, they even put a usable finger choil on a dagger style blade. Yeah. How cra that's crazy, you know? So and, I, uh, I, I'm going to be honest with you, Dave. I love the way that thing looks, but it sticks in my every dagger design that isn't double-edged sticks in my craw i say um yeah. if, if you're well and i'll tell you why it's not just a, that i would prefer double edges or or the aesthetic thing but it's also that that means that the swedge or the thinness at the tip of the blade is going to run all the way up to the handle on the dorsal side so when you're putting your thumb down in yeah. that grip it's a very thin 
Um, right. Whereas right. a don't... bayonet grip would leave, leave you a little um, a little fat section they before gave you, it tapered. Gave you a nice bit of jimping here, though. Oh, yeah. So if you don't lay your thumb all the way down and you bring it back, uh, you've got some very usable jimping there. Um, they gave you a little bit here on the back strap, and there's jimping right there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for 50 bucks and uh, on bearings and drop shut for a dagger, I mean, it's hard to beat. Yeah. And no, it's not, it looks perfectly symmetrical, but I think Jared at Neve's Knives said it wasn't quite symmetrical, but I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing yep. it being I'm seeing it being symmetrical, but you know, yeah, it could well, be. Well, I guess once you sharpen it a couple of times, it won't be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, Dave. Uh, I like to I like to wrap up these interviews with guys like you who have YouTube channels and who have huge collections or any collection, but you know that that collector instinct. I like to run you guys through a speed round, um, where I'm just asking you questions to which I get a one word answer. Um, and so this is going to really give us a profile of who you are as a, as a knife collector. I'm an enigma, but <laughs> give, it your, give it your best. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Speed round, sir. And I might, I might. Okay. All right. Here we go. About 15 questions. Are you ready? Fixed or folder? Folder. Uh, flipper or thumb stud? Thumb stud. Washers or bearings? Bearings. Tip up or tip down? Tip up. Always. Tanto or Bowie? Mm. Bowie. I'm shocked. Okay. <laughs> uh, hollow ground. Well, uh, yeah. It depends upon whether it's an Americanized Tanto or not. I'll, take a, like I'll take a traditional Tanto. Okay, without the faceted front, without the right. sharp angle up front. Which okay. was never a tanto anyway, but <laughs> I digress. Hollow ground or flat ground? Flat ground. Full size or small? Full size. Gentleman's knife or tactical knife? Tactical knife. Automatic or ballet song? Automatic. Really? Again, shocked yep. with your background. Uh, okay, uh, zero tolerance or riot? I have never had a Riot. Okay. I do, I do have several zero tolerance, so I'll say zero tolerance. How about this? Zero tolerance or we? Hmm, we. Okay. You see what I was going for? Sort of that yeah. uh, U.S. versus China uh, yeah. in the high-end manufacturing. Okay. Benchmade versus Spyderco. Benchmade. Real steel or steel will? Real steel. Uh, milled titanium or spring pocket clip? Spring pocket clip. Uh, carbon fiber or micarta? Micarta. That was the correct answer. <clears throat> Finger choil or no choil? Finger choil. Form or function? Mm -hmm. Function. I like that you had to think about it. Most people are like function, function. Me, I'm like form. I, I'm looking for the knife. Well. That, I'm looking for the knife that has both. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay, and finally, and this is the hard one: one knife for the rest of your life. That's that desert island knife. What would it be? Mm. Uh, but, 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 but. I would take a Hogue button lock. A Hogue button lock. I know you just got one recently, right? That you were. Uh, Oh, wait. No, no, I'm thinking of someone else. Sorry. Hogue button lock. Let's see. Oh, yeah. What is that? The ESO3? I think this is the... They don't label them. I think that's the O3 with that's the, the G-Mascus. It's such a solid knife. You can't go wrong with the button lock. It's got the double lock if you need it. It's got their piranha grip, which is crazy grippy without wrecking up your pocket. Right. And it's an Alishowitz design. And it's an Alishowitz design. I got uh, that and I got a EX, I think, I think that one I just showed you was the EX-01. And I have the EX-03, which is the phenolic uh, molded handle. 
Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. And, and it's and I that's in a Tonto. That's in a very uh, usable Tonto. That was the first Hogue knife I had. Uh, yeah. I liked it a lot. I ended up selling it, but uh, that, that's that's just what happens when we when we need to get new knives. I like the button locks. They're a good way to go. I mean, I like Axis. I like uh, the Able Lock, which is the you know Axis ripoff, so to speak. But um, I like the button locks. Hogue does a. They don't wiggle. I mean, you take a knife like this. There's wiggle in that blade. Yeah. And I mean, there's like no bushings or anything. That's that thing rides right on the blade. Uh, the handle rides on the blade. But you take um, you take that that um, hog I just showed you. Mm -hmm. It's just drum tight solid. Love and so are their autos. So, well, I Dave, like them as a company. Tell tell. Oh, I do too. Uh, it's a family owned company. They've been around for forty years or something like that. Fifty. I liked years. your interview. Your interview is great. Yeah, he was a he's a he's a really cool guy. Uh, Dave, tell everyone where they can catch up with you, where they can find your videos, or, uh, any other social media, and uh, and how they can reach out to you if they wanna if they wanna find well, out more. Well, basically, I'm on Instagram as this old sword, and I'm on uh, YouTube as this old sword blade reviews. So that's the uh, best way to contact me if you want to IM me on uh, Instagram. Uh, that's a good way to, to uh, send me a personal message or contact me, and then we can arrange email and whatnot after that. Well, Dave, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad that this latest um, cycle of collecting has, has uh, spurned the genesis of your channel. I really like it, and it's a, you really have that eclectic collection of knives that there aren't a lot of videos of out there. And I think that's maybe a, a unique selling proposition to your channel is that you can go to your channel to see reviews of not of that Max Ace or that, or that weird yep. one you were just <laughs> holding up. <laughs> and that's kind of what, I, that's kind of how I'm starting to uh, evolve, see my own channel. Like uh, I, you know, just showing things that there aren't too many of out there. Cause I'm just following what I like. Uh, and I, I think, you're doing the same thing. So, you, Bob, you're doing a great job. I had to take a moment to, to give you a shout out too, because uh, I follow your channel, I follow your podcast, and uh, nobody's covering the knife world like you are. Ah, oh, thank you. Me and Jim. Jim and I do it together. Oh, and, and Jim. Yeah. Uh, kudos to Jim. Yeah. The, and, the he's the uh, Wizard of Oz uh, behind the curtain. Yeah, right? He is. <laughs> he is the the power behind the throne, or. <laughs> Anyway, Dave, thanks a lot for coming on the show. I really you, appreciate Bob. your your coming on and sharing all this with us. Pleasure to be here. All righty, Catch sir. Catch up with you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Ever strop a knife again, even though it gets no real use? Face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. Well, it was great to have finally a concentrated conversation with Dave. He uh, comes on Thursday Night Knives, and like I said, we email and and that kind of thing. But it was great to just sit down and talk with him for an hour. I wonder sometimes, you know, um, uh, I think Dave's got maybe uh, 12 to 15 years on me, and I, I wonder in 12 to 15 years what my collection is going to be like. And uh, if I don't either slow down or start selling stuff off or – change my tastes. I might be, you know, I might be up to my neck in them. Um, yeah. Uh, interesting guy. I'm so happy I got to have Dave on the show. Uh, watch him on this old sword blade reviews. You can check out a lot of very interesting knives that other people are not doing reviews of. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I am Bob DeMarco saying have a wonderful week and meet us back here uh, next week for another great interview. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast mm -hmm.